am. Yes, Judy, welcome. Thank you so much for coming and sharing your knowledge with us about photographing moths and butterflies. I'm going to hand it over to you because that's what we've all come to hear. Great. Thanks very much, Bronwyn. Okay, I'm going to... Yeah. Can everyone uh, see my screen now? Yes. Okay, good. Okay. Well, I spend a lot of time outdoors with my camera and macro lens, and I'm actually not specifically into lapse. I'm into anything that insects, spiders, whatever, but I do particularly love butterflies. And it's a lot of fun being outside taking pictures of them, especially now with COVID not wanting to go all these other places. But I do it anyway, but why should you do it? And there are a number of reasons. Um, I think the most common reason is uh, to get a picture with enough details that you can ID it at your leisure. But sometimes it's nice to take a picture to tell about the organism um, and its place in the natural world. Or I know at least one person on the call, Barbara takes wonderful pictures that are artistic and suitable for hanging on your wall. I'm going to talk about photography in general aperture, shutter speed, ISO, and how to compose a pleasing picture. I'm going to discuss some equipment that I have used, cell phone, point-and-shoot cameras, super zoom point-and-shoot or bridge cameras, and go into a little bit more detail about using cameras with interchangeable lenses, which are digital single lens reflex cameras and some mirrorless cameras. I'm also going to spend a little bit of time on photographic ethics and etiquette. I'm not going to talk about video because I just don't know enough about it. I hope to get into it in the future though. My primary experience is with digital single lens reflex photography and researching how to use cell phones and point and shoot cameras um, for this talk was quite an education and I might use my cell phone more in the future. I'm going to start by talking about how you get enough light to produce the correct exposure. If you take pictures on an automatic setting, you probably don't need to deal with this, but it's really helpful to understand the relationship between aperture, shutter speed, and ISO. The lens aperture, which is what you're seeing in this slide, is the opening through which light passes to the camera sensor. And these settings are uh, referred to as f-stops. It's a little bit confusing, but the wider open aperture has the lower number. So uh, f1.4 that you see on the upper left here allows a lot of light through the shutter, whereas f16, which you see in the bottom right of this picture, allows in very little um, light. A wide open aperture lets in a lot of light, but it doesn't give you a good depth of field in your picture. Whereas if you have not much light getting in, you will have much better depth of field. And to show how aperture affects depth of field, I took two pictures of a cooperative subject. And I think someone said they saw a snowberry clear wing this week. This is a snowberry clear wing. And this picture was taken at a very wide open aperture, f2.8, which is the widest aperture I have on the lens I use. Note that the eye and a small portion of the body are in focus, but everything else is blurry. Now I took this one at f16, which um, means that it was not allowing much light in. And I compensated for the lack of light by increasing the ISO and lowering the shutter speed. And you can see that a whole lot more of the Snowberry clear wing is in focus than in the last picture. So aperture is one way of controlling light. Shutter speed controls the amount of time the lens allows light to enter it. So if you use a higher shutter speed, less light will enter. Um, so with all other settings being equal, an image with a higher shutter speed will be darker than an image with a lower shutter speed. But having a slower shutter speed can cause motion blur. And you can see that here on, this is a hummingbird clear wing. Um, the last one was a snowberry clear wing. But um, the body is in focus, but the wings which are moving are blurry because it's not a very fast shutter speed. Aperture and shutter speed have a reciprocal relationship 
And that means that if you change the shutter speed and aperture by equivalent amounts, you'll get the same exposure. So if you have an F2 aperture, which is really wide, and 1 250th of a second shutter speed, which is fairly fast, you could also get the same amount of light by using an F2.8 aperture, which is half as wide as F2, and 1 125th of a second shutter speed, which is half as fast as 1 250th of a second shutter speed. Then ISO determines the sensitivity of the camera sensor to light. If you have a higher ISO, you have more sensitivity, so you need less light to produce correct exposure. And that has an inverse relationship with shutter speed and aperture. So if you double the ISO, you can have the aperture or shutter speed to get the same amount of light to your camera sensor. But the downside of increasing the ISO is that you also increase the graininess or noise of the picture, and that makes it look less sharp. This picture was taken at a super high ISO, and I was hoping it would show how grainy it was, but it actually doesn't look all that grainy. Um, you can also uh, produce a grainy picture by taking a very underexposed picture, even with a low ISO. And depending on what equipment you're using and specifically how recent it is, um, a lot of newer cameras and cell phones do quite well with high ISO. So, you know, it's all dependent on your equipment. And you can also reduce the noise in your picture um, in post-processing. I'm, you know, an old photographer, both in terms of the number of years I've been taking pictures and in terms of my physical age. And it just kills me to use a high ISO. I almost always use a low ISO and I think my pictures are better for it. So I only increase my ISO to get more light if I'm unable to get enough light by um, massaging my aperture or shutter speed. So I've just talked about the three things that every thing you take pictures with uses, but you can also increase the amount of light for your photo by using a flash or external light source. And I'll go into that more as I cover camera gear. But what we have in this picture are a point and shoot camera with a built-in flash on top of it. Um, a flashlight, which I use all the time when I'm mothing to get some light on the subject. This is an LED video light, which I also find quite useful. And this is the flash off of my camera. So we've talked about light. Now, if you're taking a picture to get an ID, you need to ensure that you've got enough information to get the ID. For some butterflies and moths, getting a good dorsal shot is enough. This is obviously a viceroy butterfly. There's nothing else it can be. But for many um, skippers, you need to get both the dorsal and the ventral view. And they don't always cooperate. I, have no trouble getting one, but I don't always get both of them. Knowing your subject helps. This is a little glassy wing, one of the skippers, and they have a white spot right below the antennal club. So if you know that, it's helpful to try to get a picture with that um, detail. For moths, try to get both the dorsal and the lateral view because that should give you more, more chance of getting it. But there are uh, some moths that can't easily be, be identified to species by a photograph. Some can only be told apart by microscopic examination. And Tim Reichard, who's um, a local, very good moth person, told me what this was as far as genus, but you can't get this to species with just a photograph. So if you want someone to look twice at your photograph, and most of us, take pictures both for ourselves and to show others. It's helpful to compose it well. Composition ideally should help identify, emphasize, complement, isolate, or highlight the subject, not detract from it. And there have been whole books written about photographic composition, and I'm not going to give you a whole book's worth, but I'm going to mention a few points. I think the biggest rule of composition is the rule of thirds. And that says that a photograph is more interesting if the subject isn't exactly centered, but instead is at the intersection of grid lines, which I've put in this picture. 
And I actually, my subject isn't totally on the rule of thirds, but it still looks better than it would if I had put it right in the middle. And this is a juniper hair streak, which is one of our lovely local butterflies. Um, related to the rule of thirds, I think pictures are more interesting when the subject is off center. I could have cropped my picture like this with the subject in the center. And it's not a bad shot, but it's not really all that interesting compositionally. So I cropped it differently. Um, I cropped it less closely with the subject to the left. It's still not right on the rule of thirds grid lines, but it looks a lot better to my eye. But what really matters is how it looks to your eye. So now I've just told you don't put the subject in the center, but another principle of composition is symmetry. And sometimes putting the subject in the center works. I think the reason it worked well in this picture is because you've got an interesting background. If it had been a white background, I think having this butterfly in the center would have been really boring. Another thing you can do to make your picture better compositionally is to use leading lines. And leading lines are lines that appear in a photograph that have been framed and positioned by the photographer to draw the viewer's eye toward a specific point of interest. And I find that easier in landscape photography than in insect photography because you don't have control over a whole lot of um, the elements. But I think here, the green stem draws my eye along the length of the caterpillar and the brown stem points to the frass. Another compositional technique that this um, picture illustrates is balancing elements. It sort of cracks me up that you might use caterpillar and frass to offset each other, but they do kind of offset each other. And it also tells a story, you know, caterpillars live to eat and they produce an amazing amount of frass. Um, some other things to consider with composition are Try to have an uncluttered background, appropriate lighting, subject properly focused, as much depth of field as you can, not too much negative space, which is space that, like on this top right picture, all that sort of grayish blue is negative space. And really whatever pleases your eye. It's often quite difficult to get an uncluttered background when you're taking pictures of moths and butterflies but you can try changing your position to get a less cluttered background like I did here with this milkweed tussock moth caterpillar. On the bottom left, I've got a shot with lots of clutter in the background. On the right, I held the milkweed leaf up against the sky and so I have an uncluttered background. Now I actually prefer the cluttered background in this one because um, it shows the devastation that these gregarious caterpillars can do, but the uncluttered background is better compositionally. Another technique you can use to create an uncluttered background is to bring a neutrally colored piece of construction paper with you and hold it behind the subject. And that does work relatively well, I find, for caterpillars, but anything that flies immediately leaves. So it's helpful for caterpillars, not for adults. If you're using a telephoto lens and the background is slightly distant from your subject, the background will typically be blurring and less distracting. So if you use a telephoto lens, you may have less problem with a cluttered background. Another thing compositionally is using repetition can be good. I have trouble with repetition because quite often my photographs just look messy, but I thought this one of Eastern tent caterpillars worked pretty well. I think having just a little bit of free space in the middle helps. Um, try taking a picture of, of the lep from a different angle to distinguish your photograph from everyone else's shot of the same species. This shot engages the viewer much better than the shot of the back of the moth and creates an interesting viewpoint. This is not a good ID photo though. And this is a yellow collared scape moth. Contrasting textures can isolate a subject. My screen door isn't the ideal background texture, but the diminutive, diminutive wave stands out nicely against it. And here's another shot that has a lot of textures and it also has converging lines that lead the eye from left to right. 
complementary colors. If you happen to be lucky enough to find a butterfly or moth against complementary background, go for it. But there are exceptions to every rule. This is a pretty monochromatic shot, but I still find it pleasing. Composing the shot in your camera is ideal, but you can do various things in post-processing to improve your composition, for example, cropping or rotating. This is an Ilanthus webworm, and I didn't like the moth's position in this picture, so I rotated and cropped it, and here's the result. I think this is a much less distracting picture than the one before. And here's another picture. This is um, right out of the, uh, the camera. I, I haven't done any processing on it. And here's how I cropped initially. I used the same aspect ratio, just cropped a little bit of the negative stuff out of it. But it's still really messy background wise. And there's a lot of empty space, that negative space I was talking about. So I tried cropping it square, but that looked kind of boring. You know, the, the subjects in the center, it just, it's an okay butterfly picture, but it's not a well composed picture. So this is the crop I ended up liking the best. It shows more of the flower and all of the butterfly, but there isn't a whole lot of wasted space. Cropping can help make a picture more effective, but it's really subjective. You might like a different style than I do. And one more note about cropping, which I ran into um, fairly recently. If someone's using your picture in a publication, they quite often like the picture to not be too tightly cropped, especially if the picture is being used near the internal edge of the page. So I've spent a lot of time trying to train my eye compositionally. I started years ago by examining pictures in my newspaper. This obviously is before I got all my news online, but the principle is the same. Some pictures appealed to me, others did not. So I tried to figure out why did the picture appeal to me? For instance, was the subject of the photo immediately obvious or did I have to read the caption to determine what the photographer intended? That to me is bad. If the photo was in color, like the one um, on the lower left, did the color add to the picture or distract? In this case, um, this was the fires in California. I think the color just makes the picture. I, I think it's wonderful. Then I tried to apply what I saw to taking my own pictures. And obviously this is you know, not easily verified, but I think the analysis has improved my photography. I also have attended competition night at my local photography club and listening to the critiques has really helped me learn about what I do and do not want in my pictures. It's always interesting to have a picture that tells a story. This is a common buckeye. So for those of you out there who uh, say you like buckeyes, here's one. Um, and it's nectaring on milkweed. Milkweed's kind of unusual in, in the flower world in that the sexual parts of the flower are hidden. Milkweed pollination only occurs when an insect such as this butterfly gets its foot stuck inside the milkweed flower. So here we have the um, buckeye again, and the yellow things that are clinging to the buckeye's legs are milkweed pollinaria. If the buckeye goes to another milkweed flower that's not part of the same milkweed clone, it may insert its leg with pollinaria inside another milkweed blossom and pollination will occur. So I, I like that this picture tells a story. This is not a classic butterfly picture, but it really demonstrates something in the natural history world. Here's another one that tells a story. This is a decorator caterpillar, which is the larva of the wavy lined emerald moth. And it uses plant material as camouflage and it attaches it to itself using silk that it um, excretes. And it replaces its camouflage on a daily basis. Having the picture of the caterpillar and the flower with the florets missing tells a story. This is a snowberry clear wing that's just taken off after nectaring on a flower. Moths and butterflies, most, almost all, Moths and butterflies have proboscises and they um, curl them up when they're not in use. And this moth is in the process of retracting its proboscis as it flies away. So this is a, you know, there's lots of pictures of snowberry clearwings out there, but I think this is a fairly unusual one. 
And this yellow collared scape moth almost seems to be salivating at the sight of the milkweed blossom. So here's another compositional thing. Try to get all of your intended subject in the photo, or at least make it look like you deliberately omitted some of it. And that's not always easy with moving insects. And this is one where I did not get all of it in the picture. So I normally would have trashed this, but when I was making up this presentation, I thought, oh, I can use this. Make sure that the subject of your photo is in focus. The milkweed flower is in focus, but the moth isn't. I would have also thrown this one out, except for purposes of the presentation. And the shallow depth of field that is a challenge in macro photography means that sometimes not all of the picture is in focus. But if the eyes are in the shot, make sure they're in focus. The zebra swallowtail has the wings in focus, the proboscis in focus, but the eyes are not in focus. So this is a shot that could have been good, but it isn't. And here's one where the eyes and the proboscis are in focus and it's a much better picture. Okay. Now you know how to get enough light on your subject and how to compose your picture. Now you need to decide where to go to take pictures. Are you looking for a particular species? Certain LEPs have specific habitat requirements. For instance, in our general area, Olympia marbles are found in shale barrens, so you wouldn't want to look for them on the eastern shore. Some species are around, are around much of the year and others are out only for a few weeks. Generally speaking, butterflies like nectar. So if you're not after a specific species, go somewhere that has lots of nectar plants and especially if they're native species. There's some excellent butterfly gardens in our area, including but not limited to Eastern Net National Wildlife Refuge's butterfly garden just across the Bay Bridge, Kenilworth Aquatic Gardens in DC, Glendenning Nature Preserve in Anne Arundel County, and the picture here is Meadowood Special Recreation Management Area's Pollinator Garden in Southern Fairfax County, Virginia. Roadside habitats and power line cuts could be good for butterflies if they're not mowed too frequently. Look for butterflies in muddy spots puddling to get minerals. Another good place to spot puddling butterflies is on poop. Poop also contains a lot of minerals. But my favorite way of deciding where to go for butterflies is to read uh, Rick Borchelt's weekly LEP log. It's packed with information about what to see and where to see it, and typically has excellent photographs, such as this one by my friend Lydia, who I think is on the call. Moth locations are a little more tricky. I see day flying moths at flowers and on vegetation, especially under vegetation. This brown spot in the holly is a moth a grapevine looper moth. But the best way to see a lot of moths is to set up a black light at night. I get reasonable diversity on my back deck, but if you can arrange to go to a park at night, like Bronwyn was talking about that the Natural History Society of Maryland did, um, you'll likely get many more moths because it's better habitat than my suburban backyard. When you're searching for moths and butterflies, keep your eyes open for movement. Ideally, you'll spot your quarry first, but at least in my case, it's more likely that I'll see the butterfly after I've disturbed it. I watch where it goes and I try to follow, as long as I'm not destroying habitat. When approaching an insect, move slowly, no jerky movements. Have your equipment in position so that you don't have to make a long movement to get it in position because that movement to get your camera up to your eye often spooks your subject. I often approach with my camera held up almost to my eye for that reason. If you're going for an ID, get the ID shot first and then concentrate on getting that beautifully composed shot that uh, you really want. Um, using video at first as you're approaching will help ensure that you get some picture of it. Um, butterflies really hate it if you put your shadow on them. Um, and then try not to disturb surrounding vegetation because if you move something, usually the insect will fly. Insects will also easily spot you if you obstruct, obstruct their view of the sky. So if possible, stay low enough that your head is below the insect's view of the horizon. And you know, I'm old and I have trouble doing this. So this is me trying to be low. 
alter your perspective. If you stand over a butterfly and point your camera down, that is if they haven't already flown away, it's usually a pretty boring picture. Decide on your angle. Lower is usually better in most cases. If your camera has a movable screen, you may be able to use it to get a different angle on things. Here's a fairly boring picture taken from above. This is a more interesting angle. I'm more at, at the Zabulon's level. Having your inset perpendicular to the camera helps you get a maximum depth of field. Take lots of pictures because you never know which one will be the money shot. If your equipment has the option of taking pictures in raw format, do so because raw records an awful lot more information. And sometimes even though the picture doesn't look very good on your screen, you can bring out detail in processing if you've taken it in raw. If you're shooting in raw, you can even overexpose slightly to keep noise low and, and still recover the data. Look for interesting um, opportunities like dewy mornings. I, I love dewy mornings. Um, I'm showing here something that is a bad thing to do, having a lot of bulky gear. I sometimes carry two cameras and I never get, get as good pictures when I'm carrying two cameras because stuff gets in the way. Travel light. I do use autofocus quite a lot, but it may not be enough. Use manual focus if necessary. And for cell phones and some point and shoot cameras, move the camera to toward or away from the subject until the subject is in focus. Practice with your equipment before you go out in the field. If you want to do macro photography, try taking pictures of household objects to get used to the technique. And this was a tip from my friend Barbara, who's also on the call. It's amazing how dirty lenses can get. After I took this shot, I gave my macro lens a thorough cleaning. And I think most of us who use um, interchangeable lens cameras do clean our lenses fairly often, but the lens on your cell phone should also be cleaned on a regular basis. And I don't know that that many people do that. I don't see many people doing that. And it is frustrating when I've spent half an hour trying to get a decent butterfly picture and it keeps flying away just as I'm about to depress the shutter. And it's even more frustrating when my knee bumps vegetation and I scare away my own subject. But my pictures are always better when I'm not uptight about missing a shot or not finding my intended subject. So relax, you're supposed to be having fun and you can have a really good day outdoors even when you don't get that special shot. So now I'm going to talk about equipment. Cell phones have become ubiquitous and no one I know travels anywhere without one. So you'll always have it with you when you see butterflies and moths. And the equipment you have with you is the best equipment to have. Cell phone cameras are pretty amazing and each new generation of phones brings improvements. Cell phones are small and light. They have a long focal depth, meaning you get good depth of field. You don't have to change lenses like you would have to do with the digital single lens reflex. And they're good for wide angle macro work. And in case you're wondering what wide angle macro is, it's a technique where one focuses on the subject like the butterfly, but one can still see the environment behind the subject slightly out of focus. Cell phone cameras also do really well with HDR or high dynamic range, meaning that it somewhat balances out light and shadow in high contrast scenes but there are a lot of drawbacks to cell phone photography of LEPs. Because of the small sensor in the cell phone, images may be noisy or grainy. There's a shutter lag, meaning that when you depress the shutter, it doesn't immediately take the picture. You have a short working distance, limited magnification, and less control over light and optics than you would with a camera. The lack of a viewfinder means that you might have trouble seeing the screen in bright light. You can somewhat compensate for that by brightening your screen to the maximum extent possible. And wearing a wide brimmed hat can provide shade so that you can see the screen. The downside that I find to the wide brimmed hat is that it makes it even harder to sneak up on a butterfly. But this is my husband, Jimmy, taking a picture of the Eastern tiger swallowtail that that orange arrow is pointing to. And his um, 
wide-brimmed hat is nicely shading the cell phone screen. To focus on your subject with a cell phone, tap your phone screen to set a focal point. You can also adjust the amount of light that's being let in by moving the slider up or down beside the focal point box. And I mentioned earlier that it's not always easy to focus um, on something like a butterfly with a cell phone. So you might get better results by moving the cell phone back and forth until the subject is in focus. And of course, depress the shutter gently to minimize um, the movement of your phone. You can take a cell phone picture of a butterfly without any add-ons, but you'll probably need to expand your screen and the result will probably be grainy once again because of that very small cell phone sensor. I purchased the Maglite Pro app for $1.99 and it allows additional magnification with less grain. And bonus, it allows me to read menus in dimly lit restaurants, but it still doesn't take really good lap pictures. To get really good macro pictures, you'll need an add-on lens. There are a lot of them and reading reviews of them will allow you to select the one that is best for you. And there's a pretty wide range of prices on these. There's some that are, you know, 50 bucks. This one I think was closer to $200, but it was several different attachments, not just one. Um, some come with specialized cases for your phone like this one does. Some clip on your existing case and there are various magnifications. Personally, I like clip-on lenses because then I don't have to get a new case every time I get a new phone. But my husband got this one and he liked the case, so we have the case. Some of the add-on lenses come with specialized software that allow you to take cell phone pictures in RAW, which, like I said before, is a really handy thing to have. It's pretty challenging to take decent cell phone pictures in dim light. You can use the cell phone flash, but it tends to be fairly harsh and that will blow out um, some of your highlights in your picture. I sometimes use a video light, which is what this is, with phone photography, and that provides a constant not too bright light. And it's also great at night when you're black lighting. And you can get a holder to attach um, a video light to your phone if you like. My final tip for cell phone photography is to take advantage of free classes. Jimmy and I have iPhones and our Apple store offers free classes in photography. That's not going to be specific to Lepidopter photography, but it does help you to understand the capabilities of your phone's camera. Okay, I'm now going to talk about point and shoot cameras. And there are just thousands and thousands of them and more models come out every day. So any research I may have done is already outdated. Some point of shoots are cheap and simple, but they do give you a few advantages over a smartphone, most commonly an optical zoom lens. And that allows you to take pictures that aren't too grainy at a greater distance. They usually have larger sensors than cell phones. And so that allows for higher res resolution pictures as well. They also tend to have higher burst speeds, meaning you can take more pictures in a short amount of time and better low light performance than most smartphones. We have two point and shoot cameras. My favorite is the one that Jimmy's holding in this picture, which is an Olympus Tough TG6. And that costs about $400. We actually got it because we were going on a trip where we were snorkeling and it's waterproof to 50 feet, but it's a good, one for macro photography because it has both um, a macro mode and a microscope mode. So you can get really detailed pictures with it. You can take pictures in RAW and it can take 20 frames per second, which is all I would ever need for butterfly or moth photography. So it's really rugged and it takes great macro pictures, but the sensor is still pretty small and it doesn't have much of a telephoto capability and there's no fully manual control. You know, I for a long time, I never took pictures in manual mode with anything, but, and most people I know don't, but you have more control if you have the option of taking things in manual and especially manually focusing to tweak the focus. I think I, I would really like that if I were using a point and shoot all the time. Our other uh, point-to-shoot camera is the Nikon Coolpix L830. 
And this is an older model in the Cool Pick series and it costs about $300. I don't think it takes as good pictures, macro pictures as the little one we have, but it has a 34X optical zoom. So it's much better for telephoto. And it uses AA batteries, which is really convenient. But the downside of a camera that uses those convenient batteries is that cameras that use rechargeable lithium ion batteries tend to have a faster response. It's light, but it has a grip, and that makes it much easier to hold steady than the one I showed you before. It has some image stabilization, but notice that Jimmy's using the fence to stabilize it as well. Point-and-shoot cameras start at about $100, but some bridge cameras can cost almost $2,000. Obviously, the more you pay, usually the more features you get. But at least, unlike with digital single lens reflex cameras, once you've paid the money, you're mostly done. So here's what I would look for when buying a point and shoot camera. What's your price point? What is the sensor size? The larger the sensor, the more resolution is possible in your pictures. How much does it weigh? Some point and shoot cameras will fit in a jacket pocket while others are more bulky. What range of focal lengths does the camera have? There's a newer Nikon Coolpix model that has an eye-popping 83X magnification. But do you really need that kind of range? I don't, I think 30X would be as much as I would ever use. Are the pictures taken at the maximum focal length sharp? Does the camera have a macro mode? To me, that's really important. It, may not be for you, but I think having the possibility is helpful. Can you manually focus? There aren't a lot of point and shoot cameras that allow that, but if you can manually tweak the focus after using autofocus, you will get better pictures. Does the camera have some type of image stabilization or vibration reduction? Because that will allow you to get better pictures at a lower shutter speed. Does the camera have a built-in flash? Does it have a hot shoe so that you can attach an external flash? The more possibilities for additional lighting that you have, the better. Does the camera have a rotating screen? That's really helpful when you're composing pictures at odd angles. Does the camera have a viewfinder? Many people don't care about this, but it is a whole lot easier to focus with one in bright sunlight. To enhance your macro capability, consider using a Raynox attachment. This is a lens that you can clip on anything with a filter size of 50 to 67 millimeters. So you can use it on many pointed shoot cameras, also on some digital single lens reflex lenses. And this particular one um, gives a 2.5X magnification and it's um, well under hundred dollars. So it's much cheaper than a macro lens. Okay, um, I'm going to pause and ask if anyone has any questions on cell phones or point and shoots before I get into the bigger cameras. Um, we did have some, this is Bronwyn. We did have somebody ask what, what would you use to clean a cell phone or iPhone lens? Okay, I use the same thing to clean all of my lenses. I get these special packets that have a wet, cleaner and then a dry thing. So you, the, there's two things, two parts to the packet, but uh, I just use a lens wipe quite often. You know, one of those little uh, chamois like cloths. Um, the thing about chamois type cloths is that they do eventually get greasy. So you will want to wash your chamois like cloth periodically, but that, that'll do a good job. It's a good question. Um, and Deborah wanted to know what the picture that you have right now, what is the lens that you're currently displaying? This is a Raynox attachment. And this is something that clips onto the end of some point and shoot camera lenses and some digital um, single lens reflex DSLR lenses. It, it's based on the filter size, anywhere between uh, 52 and 67 millimeters. So the very small point and shoot cameras, you would not be able to use it on, but most of the super zooms you would be able to use it on. 
Um, Barbara just wanted to know, do you need a fancy camera if you never plan to make paper prints? Well, that's a good question, Barbara. And I know Barbara knows the answer to this question, but um, I think the more capabilities you have, the better. And having a fancy camera allows an awful lot more options than having a non-fancy camera. So no, you don't have to have a fancy camera to get good pictures. You have more capabilities if you have the fancy camera. So it depends how much work you want to put into it and how much weight you want around your neck. And Barbara will also tell you that the cotton carrier is a really wonderful thing for carrying a heavy camera. And I would recommend that as well. Um, and one that's not, is, is, it was just out there is what percentage um, uh, are keepers for you? How many do you do you take and versus how many that you keep? Well, that's a question that has a different answer depending on why I'm taking them. Um, I would say for ID purposes, I probably have a higher percentage than for aesthetic purposes. I, I'd probably say one in 10 for my aesthetic purposes and probably one in three for ID purposes. That's a pretty good uh, ratio. Uh, Chris wanted to know, is there a good lens to attach to a phone that is telephoto and macro? So telephoto and macro combined. Um, in my experience, there is not one that is good for both. In other words, not I've, I'm not aware of good zooms, but many attachments, when you buy the, the attachment, it comes with a telephoto and a macro, but they're different attachments. So it's sort of like the single lens reflex. You have a different lens for a different purpose. And I'm not positive there aren't zoom attachments for macro lenses. I haven't seen any that were recommended. All right. I think we're good to go. Judy, okay. We'll keep Okay, now we come to um, the setup that I normally use, um, a DSLR, which as I, I keep saying, di digital single lens reflex. But I'm just going to use the abbreviation now. Um, the advantage to these are they have larger sensors than cell phones and most point and shoot cameras. So you're going to get a higher resolution picture. You have a choice of lenses to use, which can be both an advantage and a very expensive curse. You've got much more control over your picture than with cell phones and many point and shoot cameras. So you can set aperture and shutter speed and so on. That gives you more control. It also is more of a pain. And being able to manually focus is sometimes helpful and you can, and in my opinion, should use a flash. This is a Canon 5D Mark IV body with a full frame sensor because DSLRs don't all have the same sensor size either, but the larger the sensor, the more resolution. And this is a Canon 100 millimeter f2.8, that's the aperture image stabilized macro lens and a special macro flash. I usually shoot at ISO 100, 1 250th of a second shutter speed, which is the sync um, point of my flash, meaning that's the highest shutter speed I can use with the flash in normal mode. I use an aperture between eight and 16, and I use my flash at a quarter power. That doesn't mean that this is what you should use, but I find this works well for me. Um, the new mirrorless cameras are really amazing. Most have image stabilization built into the bodies. So it's not just the lens that has image stabilization, but the body does. And that means that you can take pictures at a lower shutter speed without um, motion blur. Um, some have interesting features like in-camera focus stacking, which allows you to take several pictures taken with slightly different focus points so that you get a combined picture with more of the, the subject in focus. There are four third format mirrorless cameras that are less heavy than most DSLRs, but they have a smaller sensor so in my opinion, if you can carry the weight, go for the full frame mirrorless 
even though they are a bit pricey. And this is the one that I'd really like to get, but this is not implying that you should buy Canon. You should buy whatever brand you like, make your own decision. I have a lot of investment in Canon lenses, so I'm sticking with Canon, but Nikon is good, Olympus is good, Pentax is good, they're all good. The macro lens, which is a lens that allows one-to-one -one magnification, means that I need to get quite close to my subject. There's other focal lengths of macro lenses. Faster lenses, uh, those with greater maximum aperture, which is a lower value f-stop like this one, and image stabilization or vibration reduction are, in my opinion, the best kind to get. And you could also use a zoom lens, but if you do, check to see what the minimum focusing distance is for that lens. Because if you're using a telephoto lens and you can't focus it on the organism because it doesn't have a close focusing distance, it's not much good for this purpose, that is. You can add extension tubes to allow for a closer picture, but your depth of field will be very shallow. And what an extension tube is, is just a little piece of metal that makes the lens be a little bit further away from the sensor. Um, I occasionally use a 200 millimeter lens, not a macro lens with an extension tube to get a little bit more reach. I don't do that very often though. I previously mentioned how you can use aperture, shutter speed and ISO to um, ensure that you've got enough light on your subject. But using a flash can also help illuminate your butterfly or moth. I think that's the best way to do it really because you know you ensure that you have a consistent amount of light. You don't have half in shadow, half in the sunlight and so on. Cell phones and some point and shoot cameras have flashes, but it's challenging to control the power of the flash. Still uh, using it when you don't have enough ambient light for a picture is very helpful. If you have a true macro lens, you can't usually use a standard hot shoe mounted flash, the hot shoe being the thing on the top of the camera that you put a, a flash on because the angle of where the light needs to go is so acute. That's why I have flash heads mounted to my camera lens. There are also flashes that look like bug antennae. This is my friend Ben's um, bug antennae flash. And he can uh, aim the flash heads wherever he wants. One downside of flash is that a lot of insects, including moths and, and butterflies, have shiny insect parts and the flash can bounce right off of it, causing um, overexposure of that part. So you need some means of diffusion. And I don't know any good insect photographer who's entirely satisfied with their diffuser. So everyone is still trying to find the perfect solution. But my friend Ben has used this white thing here um, to try to diffuse the flash. I don't know whether anyone is going to say, do you use a tripod? And I don't. Um, and the reason I don't is because I can't set one up close enough to my subject without spooking it. But if you're using a longer lens, it might work for you. Using a flash external to your camera can produce interesting effects. In this case, I took one of the flash heads off my flash and put it behind the caterpillar. And that backlit the hair on it, which really emphasizes just how hairy it is. This is a Datana species caterpillar. Okay, I have one last um, hint for camera photography. Download your camera manual to your phone. And I only know how to do this on my iPhone, but I know there's an analogous uh, process for Android. You pull up the PDF manual on your phone browser, tap the share button, save it to books. And that way you'll always have your manual, even if you don't have cellular service. Now, I will say that reading the manual on my cell phone is not all that easy, but still, it saved me in the field a number of times. Okay, I'm going to go on to a very specialized photographic technique, how to get flight shots. It's always gratifying to get a bird or insect in flight, and there's techniques that can be applied to either case. Obviously, you need a longish lens, a telephoto lens. Having a high shutter speed allows you to freeze movement. 
in order to be able to use the high shutter speed, you're going to have to have a wider aperture to let in more light. Since you're focusing on something relatively small, you should use a single focal point um, to more accurately focus your subject. If you use continuous autofocus, um, your camera will strive to keep whatever is in that active autofocus point perfectly sharp, even if your subject is moving. So long as the shutter button is held halfway down, the camera and lens keep working to ensure whatever is in that um, autofocus zone is sharp when the shutter is fired. And if you do continuous shooting, multiple photos can be taken in a short time frame. I almost always use macro and I hardly ever use the telephoto lens. But this all sounded quite straightforward, so I decided to take my camera and telephoto lens to a local garden. And literally in five minutes, I had 200 shots. I had several shots of beautiful blue sky, no butterflies, and one reasonable picture here of a bee in flight. Unfortunately, I was trying to take a picture of the butterfly that you could see a small part of the um, wing in the left part of the um, picture. So, uh, Butterfly um, flight photography is hard. I finally got a butterfly flying, but you asked what my success rate was, which normally is about one in 10 um, or one in three for ID shots. Um, one in 200. I got one flight shot out of 200. So I need to practice clearly. Okay. Um, I think we all want to be ethical wildlife photographers. I know I do. But each person will have their own ideas, ideas of what ethics and etiquette are. And here's a few issues for you to consider. And I'll tell you how I feel about something, but that doesn't mean you have to feel the same way. National Geographic interviewed some of their photographers for ideas. And one principle mentioned by just about all of them was don't do any harm. For instance, don't destroy or alter habitat for a better view or scene. And learning patterns of lepidopter behavior will help you to um, avoid interfering with their life cycles. For instance, as tempting as it is to open the silver spotted skipper caterpillar's nest in order to see the full beauty of the caterpillar, it would expose it to predators, so don't do it. Some insect photographers capture and refrigerate their subjects. The purpose of this is to slow the subject down so you can take better pictures of them. And then later they uh, let them back out in the field where they found them. But, and I, I don't think this is as applicable to leps as it is to some other insects. I don't do this, but I know and respect some other photographers who do. Netting specimens is another topic that elicits strong feelings on both sides. I don't net, but I, really have my hands pretty full with my camera equipment and I'm a klutz so you know that's part of my reason for not netting. But entomologist Barbie here uses a net and she's netted a very impressive butterfly. So you need to decide if these techniques are right for you. But if you are collecting and or netting you have to make yourself aware of the rules for your location. For instance in national parks you need a permit to net. Black lighting is fun, but it can also have an impact on insects. Insects attracted to a black light may be easy prey for bats and birds, and lights in general are really not very good for insects. And this doesn't mean that it's wrong to do black lighting, but just keep in mind that lights for night insects aren't good. I occasionally set up a black light, but I don't leave it on all night. Caption your photos honestly. Um, maybe, I don't know, eight or nine years ago, there was a picture that won a National Geographic Photo Contest prize. And it was an amazing picture. And it was entitled Dragonfly and Rainstorm. But it turned out that it was actually a dragonfly being spritzed by the photographer's friend. Awesome shot, but not honestly captioned. Don't add or subtract photo elements, if, especially if you're submitting a photo in a contest or to a magazine. It is okay to crop, adjust the exposure and remove dust spots. And I admit that I have occasionally cloned out an annoying bright piece of grass that is, you know, destroying my, my beautiful picture, but 
I don't submit them to magazines or contests. And also um, disclose it if you're taking a picture of a captive specimen. This picture is a captive specimen. And speaking of one's work, showing it, I'm cautious about giving detailed location information on social media that anyone can view. This is a big problem for rare birds, especially owls. And I'm not sure it's as much of a problem for rare butterflies and moths, but I mention it so that you can figure out how you feel. I label my pictures with a fairly broad location, for instance, Patuxent Research Refuge. This narrows down the location, but not to an exact spot. I also have my camera GPS turned off, although the main reason for that is to preserve battery life. I will share exact locations with people, but only on an individual basis. Knowing the exact location isn't a problem in many cases, but if the lab has a very sensitive habitat, you don't want it overwhelmed by well-meaning visitors. This is a Hessel's hair streak, a picture of mine on iNaturalist, and the location is obscured. Um, so that means that it shows the general area, but not specific enough to lead someone to the exact spot. I will point out that I didn't deliberately obscure the location because iNaturalist does that for me because it's a vulnerable species. But I have occasionally obscured deliberately one of my um, iNaturalist sightings. And I'd also recommend removing GPS data from your images before posting a scarce species to social media. Um, you know, like, it, there's a listserv, Marilyn Lepp's Odes, that has a lot of information. And quite often it has very detailed locations, but there's a fairly small group that monitors that listserv. Facebook, anyone can view anything. And I'm not trying to trash Facebook. I'm just saying that if you don't know how broad your audience is, it's probably best to not have an exact location. And now for a few etiquette tips, many of which are tips from Rick Borchelt's excellent butterfly classes. If you're with a scheduled activity, don't get ahead of the group leader unless he or she specifically asks you to do so. And if you're in a group, everyone wants to see the butterflies and moths, so please let everyone see them before you rush in with your camera. If you've had a good look at the butterfly or moth, step back so that others can see it. For photographers, let those with longer lenses who don't need to get as close to the subject take their pictures first. Be polite, don't walk in front of someone who's looking at a butterfly with binoculars or a camera. If you're on your own, which is usually how I'm taking my pictures, Remember that other people have just as much right to be in public places as you do. When you're taking pictures of a flighty subject and someone comes up to you and says, what are you seeing and spooking your subject? Don't snap at them. And that's hard sometimes. But think of it as an opportunity to educate both about the organism and about etiquette. If other photographers are around, give them the amount of space that you'd like for yourself. Park your car in an appropriate spot. It is never okay to block a road. It's also not okay to go on private property without the landowner's permission. This, you know, you could argue either way, but I think it's rude to make demeaning comments about someone else's photographic equipment or photography. I once heard someone say to a person using a cell phone, get a real camera. Well, that's just not helpful, you know? Although I use fairly high-end equipment for my photography, I've learned some really valuable tips from photographers with cell phones, point-and-shoot cameras, and so on. We can all learn from others, be a good role model, both as a photographer and as a citizen. I'd like to finish by showing a few examples of what Rick Borchel calls extreme close-ups. I like this kind of photography for a couple of reasons. It shows how close I was able to get to the butterfly or moth. Um, Obviously, it doesn't happen every time. But um, it quite often shows a feature of the subject that I was previously unaware of. Here's a, a zebra swallowtail. And did you know their legs were this, this lovely pale greenish blue? I didn't until I took the picture. I always thought they were white. And did you know that some Lycenans have hairy eyeballs? Once again, I didn't until I took this Henry's Alphen picture. 
And that led me on a research project to see why they have hairy eyeballs. And I couldn't find anything specific to Lysanids, but researchers have observed that the spacing between the hairs on a honeybee's eyes is the same as a single grain of dandelion pollen. And dandelion is um, you know, a really common pollen that's collected by honeybees. As a result, the honeybee is able to keep the pollen suspended above its eye, allowing for its leg to comb through the hairs and collect particles when the honeybee is, is grooming. Another study of hairy eyed insects showed that ocular hairs reduce airflow at the eye surface by up to 90%. So perhaps ocular hairs act similarly to mammalian eyelashes. As the insects fly, ocular hairs deflect incoming air and create a zone of stagnant air. And that would reduce airflow and particle uh, deposition, but only minimally occlude the light. This dorsally drab Ecuadorian metal mark has a brilliant blue ventral side, pale blue hairy legs, a mite on its eye, and yep, hairy eyeballs. Did you know that an American lady's um, wings were this colorful? Or that red admirals have little blue hearts on their underwings? Here's um, a detail of a luna moth wing. So Barbara, this one's for you. Um, monarch eyes are splotched, and in this close-up, you can see pollen grains on the eye and surrounding scales. The monarch is a pollinator. And for my final photo, here's a hummingbird clear wing that I am convinced is sticking out its tongue at me. So I know this was a lot of information. Here are my three primary tips for good LEP pictures. Know your subject, know your photographic equipment, and practice. And um, I'll answer any questions that I can, but I'd also love to hear any um, tips for Lepidopter of photography that you might have. Thank you, Judy. Can we un, um, unshare and come back together as a group? I have, a, I, have, I have a suggestion uh, with regard to photographing laps. Um, and as, as um, Judy mentioned, know your subject. Knowing about the butterflies, how they feed, what they feed on, whether they hit and run or whether they stay for a period of time, uh, the parts of the day are all good tips for knowing how to approach your uh, butterfly for a photograph. And also, I start off as far, not far this way, but I start taking my photos far away and get closer, 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 closer to them until I get the maximum shot I wanna get. And uh, many times, if they fly away, don't run away. Stay there, they'll return. Thanks, Adam, that's very helpful. Thank you, Adam. Um, if you, anybody has a question, you can raise your hand and I'll call on you to unmute or you can put it into the chat box. We have a couple in the chat box. Um, let me just. Catherine wanted to know when you went to the extreme close ups, what are you using um, versus regular close ups? I'm still using my macro lens, sometimes with an extension too. Um, Catherine B, black swallowtails are hard to get photos because they continuously flap their wings. Do you have <laughs> any suggestions while they're nectaring? Um, you know, I, I took a picture the other day where the body was totally in focus and the wings were flapping and not in focus. Um, that's one where I would be tempted not to use a flash so that I could use a higher shutter speed. Judy, is there a way that we could uh, reach you and uh, with uh, further questions after this uh, seminar? Sure, I'll put my email address in um, the chat. Thank you. And Claire, Claire wanted to let you know, it's wonderful that Judy makes her pictures available for creative comments. Um, Claire says that they're the backbone of many of her presentations. I'm not sure what creative comments is. Maybe you can explain that, Judy. Well, thank you, Claire. I've, I've watched a number of your presentations and you give fabulous presentations and I'm really honored to have my pictures in them. 
Um, Creative Commons is a level of permissions on your picture. You can, if you post a picture to Flickr, which is where I post mine, you can restrict how people can use your pictures. I don't restrict people from using my pictures. You don't have to contact me. Um, I do ask that you attribute them to me. Not that I would ever know if you didn't, but <laughs> ideally I would like to people to know that I am the photographer, but um, anyone can use them for any at any time. So Claire uses them in her presentations. Um, Avis is using one of my pictures in their rent-a-car promotions. Uh, there are a bunch of extermination um, companies that use my ant pictures, which I sort of find a little repulsive, but I, I don't restrict who uses them. That's wonderful. Thank you for sharing. Um, Barbara says she was all about to give up the macro until Judy showed her how to use a macro flash, which was a game changer um, when you're ready to take that next big step. Thanks, Barbara. You've taught me an awful lot about photography, too, and I appreciate it. Ola wants to know, do you use focus stacking? I do not. Um, I know people who do. One, Could you explain what focus stacking is? Okay, focus stacking is when you take more than one picture. I mean, I've seen focus stacks of 200 pictures, which is pretty outrageous. Um, because of the shallow depth of field inherent in macro photography, you sometimes aren't going to get all of your subject in focus. So if you take a picture of the head and then a picture slightly further down the thorax and so on, you may be able to combine them all together so that you've got different parts in focus combined to make it look like the whole thing is in focus. My experience, my very limited experience with focus stacking is that anything that has hairs, and I know in, you know the laps have scales, but it's hard, it's really hard to have a live specimen and get no movement at all. I don't know if any of you know Sam Drogi, who works um, on bees. He does focus stacking, and his pictures are stunning, but his subjects are dead. You, it's easier to do when they're dead and not moving. I, I only take pictures of live things, so that's why I don't do focus stacking. I do know some people who take pictures of live insects focus stacking and get well, I'm going to say they get mixed results. I've seen a few that were good, but not too many that I thought were good. Um, no. We have, do, Allison wants to know, do you use any post-processing software or you, do you just aim for the photo you want right out of the camera? Well, I, I think pictures are always best if you get exactly what you want straight out of the camera, but I process mine and I use Photoshop. And I'm not recommending Photoshop over anything else. That just happens to be what I use. Lightroom does really well. There's something called, I think, Luminix or something that some people have been recommending. I haven't used it, so I, I can't speak to that. But I, I, what I do with almost, I crop most of my pictures. Um, I sometimes, mess with the exposure a little. Ideally, I get the exposure right, so I don't have to do that, but I sometimes do that. Um, that's about it. Uh, lots of people do a lot more. I, I'd say that I'm not, I, I, I don't know enough about processing to take full advantage of it. Um, okay, Barbara M wants to know uh, if you have any suggestions for macro flash equipment, what to try and what to avoid. Well, you need something that will get light on the subject. So, you know, the typical hot shoe mounted flash won't get light on the subject because your focal distance is so short. I don't personally like ring lights. And the reason I don't like ring lights is because if you have a subject 
this is less applicable to leps than other insects, but like if you have a jumping spider and you take a picture with a ring flash, you get the ring in the eye, which I think is ugly. Um, I like mine with two flash heads. Um, and the, the one that I showed in the presentation that looked like a flash with little bug antennae, that's quite useful, much cheaper than my flash. It's also much flimsier than my flash. So, you know, and, and it's not weatherproofed. My flash is weatherproof, which, you know, I, I wish I could say I never photograph in the rain, but that would be a lie. Um, and uh, do, 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 do. Bonnie B also recommends always preserve your base photo before cropping or doing other processing. You want to maintain that picture. Would you agree, Judy? Totally. I actually shoot in RAW plus JPEG. So I have two pictures straight out of the camera. I mostly process the JPEG, and I'd say that's not common necessarily with photographers. I only use the raw if I really have to bring out some level of detail that I can't get out of my JPEG. But I keep the both the raw and the JPEG as they are, and then I save my processed version as a different name. If you use Lightroom, which I don't, um, but many, many, many people I know do, and it, it's great. The only reason I don't use Lightroom is because I started out taking pictures not in Lightroom, and I had tens of thousands of them not in Lightroom, and I don't want to have two catalogs. So that's why I don't use Lightroom. But Lightroom is really cool in that the changes are saved separately from the original. You don't have to deliberately save your own um, original picture. And um, Barbara M., I will share my flash information. I also want to do a shout out to Jimmy for his role in this presentation, taking pictures of Judy and also being the model for some of the pictures that were in the presentation. Very well done uh, for that. Do we have any other questions for um, Judy? While she's here, we can pick her brain. And uh, this was wonderful. I hope that um, we can uh, maybe go out and uh, take pictures together sometime. I don't I'd know. Like I'm that. Throwing that out. Yeah, that would be fun to do for the as a left club um, activity. Um, and well, maybe we'll go down and visit Adam in in uh, Miami and take pictures down there with him too. So. <laughs> Adam, I am looking for a Bartram's hair streak. Every time I go down, I go to Navy Wells and try to find one, and I never do. So maybe I'll contact you when I next go down and see if you can give me some hints. Could I ask a question? Sure, Ola, go ahead. Yes, um, uh, uh, can you use a macro lens at night? You didn't talk much about photographing um, moths, which I was hoping to hear some about. So uh, I have uh, quite a few interesting moths that land on my window because um, that window faces the woods. And uh, I can take a good picture with my camera on um, a macro setting, which is kind of cheating. But whenever I try to use the, the actual macro lens, I don't get the settings right and things don't come out. And some things are very tiny, and I would love to use the macro lens to, to take photos. How, what suggestions would you give me? Well, I, I, I did mention in the presentation that I use the, a video light when I, um, when I black light, because that way I can light it well enough that my camera can focus. I did see um, in the chat, and I don't think it was your question, um, someone talking about a lens that has up to 5x magnification. I have that lens. I'm, I'm old. I can't use it except in really good light because there's not enough light for me to focus. But mm. if you're younger, you might be able to. But uh, the, the video light I find really helpful. Um, okay. I just have, it, it's a little cube. I don't, I don't remember what the model of it is, but I mean, there's a bunch of them. But um, by holding that up, um, 
and I can even actually attach to my camera using, um, you know, a, a bracket um, that gives the light to focus on, on the moth. Okay, thank you. I have a question. Um, so that was my camera that has up to 5X, um, but I never go that far because it there's a lighting issue, obviously. Um, so when I take pictures with my macro lens at one to one, I can get like the point, like one's point in focus, right. but there's a lot of blurriness on the outside. So is that, do I need to increase how much light I'm using to light the subject or do I need to try to, and so it's not an auto-focusing macro lens. So I'm kind of rocking back and forth, finding the sweet spot with my eyes as well. So I'm working on using a tripod, but is that, do I need to bump up the light or change the aperture? In order, is this the um, 65 MPE lens? Um, yes, actually it is. You're not going to get good depth of field on it as, I mean, have using a, a higher number or smaller aperture will give you more depth of field but you'll have a very difficult time focusing it. Uh, you're doing it exactly right by rocking back and forth, but it's, I only use that, I've, I have a white box that I very occasionally use. Um, I don't refrigerate my insects, but I do sometimes capture them briefly and put them in there. Um, but I only use it out, outside or with a lot of lights, you know, I, I just, I'm 68. I don't have good enough night vision to, or, or low light vision to, to use the lens, unfortunately. I so wish I could. my uh, birthday is in a couple weeks. So what should I ask my husband for as far as the macro lens goes? Well, that's the only one I know that gives the 5X. Um, for most laps, I, I'm, I'm fine. My, I have a hundred millimeter macro and that gives one to one. And it, it's, I really like it, but it, you know, if you're photographing moth genitalia or something like that, the one X, you know, the hundred millimeter won't do it. I mean, I, I get. Well, I, the, he bought me that for my birthday last year and it was, I said, I want a macro lens and he doesn't do photography. So he went and found one. So I'm not married to this lens. I was just, that's the one he gave me. So. I, I really like the hundred millimeter lens um, because it's image stabilized, which, um, you know, it's nice. Um, and you have to get pretty close, but not as close as you do with a 65. It's a relatively fast lens because the aperture is 2.8. The, the, you know, the maximum opening is 2.8. So I really like that, but the, it, you're shooting Canon, I take it. Yes. Yeah. I, I think the 100 millimeter lens is the best lens, um, macro lens. Canon also has a 180, but it's a really slow lens. The 50 millimeter, I think is, I, I don't think it gives you enough reach. What body are you shooting with? Like uh what? what what sensor size really, I guess, is the question. That's a really good question. Um, it's like the EOS 77D, does that make sense? Okay, so you have a crop sensor um, camera. That was gonna be my other suggestion. If you have a crop sensor camera, that'll get you a little bit closer too. Um, Becca um, and NBK admin are talking about Laowa macro lenses. Um, I have, uh, I don't have the Laowa macro lens. I have another Laowa lens and they are really good lenses. So, um, and Claire asks, is it more important to invest in the lenses of the body? Definitely lenses. Okay, thank you. All right, I thought I was in the middle of a, of a, of a different language there for a second. Um, <laughs> No, it was all, it's all good. Uh, any other questions for for Judy? And I like Adam, you know, that's also, should you kind of 
kind of uh, camp out in the middle of some flowers and just keep your camera at the ready and wait for them to come to you uh, kind of thing? Is that, is that also a strategy? Um, yes, yeah, so if you just want um, general butterfly pictures. So if you're searching for a particular one, not necessarily. All right. Ooh, Becca asked what black light I use. I'm going to ask Jimmy to answer that because Jimmy does the black light part. And Catherine B, yes, the MT26 EX is a flash. It's a Canon flash. Go ahead, Jimmy. Oh, well, I have one of my black lights or just fluorescent two black lights, which I suspend inside a sheet tent. I use uh, art stands to put the, the uh, sheet over and I suspend the fluorescent uh, T12 lights, black lights in there. I have all sorts of lights. I have uh, uh, LED black lights. I'm putting together now for a, a, uh, a, a, a stand. And I even went to a party store. If you go to one of these party stores, they sell black lights for, for their home for putting on parties and having uh, ghosts light up and everything. I don't have a particular one I like. The fluorescent tubes are the one I started with and I really like them, but I can't talk intelligently enough about which one is better than another one, just the one I like. We also have one that we bought from BioQuip, which is a really good biological supply um, place, but that's more expensive than the other alternatives. It's also a battery operator. You do not need power uh, external. You don't need an extension cord. And we use black lights rather than mercury vapor. Mercury vapor is good, but the lights get really hot and I'm a klutz and I don't, don't like the idea of having something that gets really hot. That's great. Um, any other questions? Any other questions? I think we're all ready, Judy, to go out and shoot some uh, shoot some butterflies and moths. And uh, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and expertise with us this evening and sharing your beautiful photography. Uh, that was just, it was wonderful imagery and it makes you happy to, to look at your photographs and, um, and what we need more of is some good, good feeling and happiness. So you help to increase that uh, in the world through your presentation. Thank you. And I hope that um, everybody here, I know that you uh, were, everybody get, got something, gained something uh, from the presentation. And I want to invite you back to learn more with the Natural History Society of Maryland. Remember, tomorrow is symbiosis, algae, and the spotted salamander. Um, and if you want to join the left club, just go to marylandnature.org. Remember, next month it is moon garden. So how to create a moon garden in your backyard to attract those moths that we want to photograph. So it's all coming back around. Um, Again, stay safe, stay curious, and stay outside, everybody, taking those pictures. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. See you soon. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. It was great. Thank you.